Welcome back to Check Your Leader TV and today we're going to do a, a bit of a rules review but with a twist. We're going to be looking at a set of rules that have been around for a very, very long time um, but I've not been able to find any uh, reviews of this rule system but they seem to have a bit of a following and they also seem to be uh, a set of rules that have been um, heavily influential in the development of other rule systems. So we're going to talk about this particular rule set that, I, uh, that I've been looking at. We're also going to talk about uh, at the end of the video, some of some other options that are available for gaming the American Revolutionary War. But uh, predominantly, we're going to be focusing on British Grenadier. come from? Where did the rules get their genesis from? Um, from what I can gather, well first of all let's just say that they've been around for a very very long time. I'm, I'm, I'm anywhere between 10 and 20 years these rules have been around for. So um, they're not new rules by any stretch of the imagination um, and getting copies might be problematic. Um, the, 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 the deluxe edition um, you get through, you can get through Partisan Press, or well, that's who produced it. I think Cavalier Books might still have copies of, of these rules, but the original copy, hard to get. Now, I had the original rules, uh, but when I found out there was a deluxe edition, and I saw what an impressive uh, book it was, I mean, it is really, I mean, the eye candy in this stuff, it's colour throughout, uh, beautiful uh, photos of um, Eureka, Perry, front rank, uh, miniatures, um, it, it's just, it's, it's a, it is a beautiful book. Like I said, hard cover. Um, so as soon as I got, got a, could get a copy of this, I did. And then I, pa I, I passed my, my original copy on to a friend of mine. I can't even remember who it was. That's how long ago it was. Um, long and long story short, they've moved on. Um, and to say I regret doing that would be an under, understatement. I don't regret helping, you know, passing, giving a set of rules to someone. What I regret is that now I don't have an original set of the rules and I'll explain why that's problematic. Um, but anyway, where did the rules uh, come from? Well, it actually explains um, in the introduction, um, it, it says that these rules were pretty much um, um, came about, uh, well, I'll just read, so these, idea, these ideas are borrowed from Andy Callan's excellent and simple rules, Loose Files and American Scramble, published many years ago in War Games Illustrated magazine. And he's not joking when he says many years ago, because I have a copy of Loose Files and American Scramble, um, and they, are, they come from the original uh, War Games Illustrated number one, which was back in September 1987. So essentially, what British Grenadier is, British Grenadier is the bastard child of Loose Files and American Scramble and another set of rules that you probably have heard of, which is General de Brigade, which was written by Dave Brown. So you have uh, Andy Callan, author of Loose Files and American Scramble, uh, also the author of Never Mind the Bill Hooks, which are a fantastic set of rules, and uh, General the Brigade by Dave Brown. And this, con this meeting of these two rule sets has resulted in British Grenadier, which was written by a chap called Eclair. Who, who Eclair is, I have got no idea. This chap is as elusive as Batman. I've uh, attempted to um, uh, seek the individual out because I've got some questions I wanted to ask in regards to the rules, but 
you know, it's like it's like trying to get a, through, a phone call through to Putin. It just ain't happening. Um, but we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But essentially, um, British Grenadier is, like I said, it's, uh, it's a meeting of two rule systems. Um, and then uh, it's created a set of rules that are uniquely, uh, that are written uniquely for war in North America in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Because not only does British Grenadier uh, cover nicely the American Revolutionary War, or the War of Independence, but it's also very useful for the French and Indian Wars, which is part of the Seven Years' War, and also the War of 1812, which was that, that war between uh, Britain, uh, Great Britain and the United States um, from the period of 1812 to 1814. And so the question, the, the obvious question is, well, what's so unique about fighting in North America during that time period? Well, I'm glad you asked. Essentially, what it is, is North America at the time was pretty much a, a, a developing world. It was a bit of a, will, a, it was literally the wilderness being uh, discovered. And um, even though there was cultivated land, it wasn't cultivated to the same extent that you would expect in, uh, in Northwest, Western Europe, um, the Mediterranean area and what have you. Um, that is to say that the, the, those areas that were cultivated uh, still had quite a lot of debris about them. And, and for armies that were fighting in a linear warfare style of, the, of that period, Maneuvering on these um, on uncultivated, uh, highly forested and wooded areas was problematic. Simply moving and dressing ranks um, was an issue. And so these rules uh, cover that quite well. Also, cavalry uh, wasn't used. It wasn't as a de decisive arm um, in North America as it was in uh, Europe. Um, and the armies tended to be smaller. Um, so when you get into the American Revolutionary War, what you find is you find a highly professional, small British army uh, and its associated uh, German uh, allies uh, fighting against a emerging, predominantly citizen-type force army, um, whose troops ranged in confidence from um, pretty good uh, right down to simply an armed rabble. Um, and as a consequence, maneuver and the simple act of drill becomes very crucial to simulating that type of warfare. Now it's also worth noting and um, uh, in regards to fighting in North America is the indigenous uh, people of the time. So. In addition to uh, the points I've already raised, you've also got uh, tribal type uh, warriors to consider. So you add all that in together, uh, heavily wooded, partially cultivated or semi-cultivated land, uh, disparity forces, professionals versus militia and, and, and what have you, throw in the indigenous population, the uh, lesser lessening of uh, cavalry as a decisive arm, and so as you can see, fighting in North America is considerably different to fighting in Europe. So the idea of just taking Napoleonic rules and using them for for fighting in the uh, in North America is probably not going to work. Okay, so without further ado, let's just jump straight into the rules and have a closer look at British Grenadier. Um, it, it is a beautiful book, full colour throughout, beautiful illustrations, lots of photos. Uh, can't speak highly enough in, in regards to the production values. This is a beautiful book. Um, the introduction talks about the Genesis um, of the rules and also a, a bit of a background introduction to the American War of Independence. Um, produced in 2011, um, so yeah, it's, it's been around for, for a decade now. Um, the index, 
Uh, first chapter covers scales, bases, and dice. You're going to use these rules for uh, both 25, 28 slash millimeter and um, 15 mil. Uh, but you could use them in any scale at all, 10 mil, 6 mil even, no problem at all. Uh, chapter 2 talk, talks about troop types and formations. Chapter 3, the role of senior officers. And this is another key factor in British Grenadiers, uh, British Grenadier Um the how you use your uh, uh, brigade commanders uh, and your commander in chief is uh, really is essential to uh, achieving success on the battlefield with these rules. Um, chapter four covers uh, setup and the game turn, in other words, a sequence of events, and then the following chapters really break down into into the individual sequences like charges, uh, sorry, command and control, charges, movement. There's a chapter about terrain, which feeds into movement. Then it goes on to talking about uh, firing. There's a chapter uh, detailing skirmishes. Uh, then there's the Malay morale. Uh, and the real nuts and, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts, the guts of the rules, disruption points. This is really what makes these rules uh, quite different from anything else. There's another chapter on uh, special or optional rules. And then there's an appendices. There's three scenarios. Uh, uh, one from the um, French and Indian Wars, one from uh, uh, the American War of Independence, and one for the War of 1812. Um, now, the, it does come with this beautiful quick reference sheet. Again, it's, uh, it's hard stock. It's, it's quite uh, robust. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as comprehensive as I would like. There's, uh, I found myself having to dive into the rules a bit because there were certain things that you just don't find in the quick reference sheet. Um, some of the movement tables could be more complete, and there are some tables that are just not here. Like there's a special table for uh, when you roll double sixes. Um, I wonder if I can find it in here. Um, the double sixes table um, is uh, right here. And as you can see, it's no small thing. Um, now, you might argue that you don't roll double sixes all that often. Well, in my game that I played just recently, we rolled double sixes at least four times in the game. If this was included in here, that would be great. Now, I can only uh, compare this with some of the, the quick reference tables or quick reference sheets that you get with games like uh, Pickett's Charge, uh, General de Arme, uh, O Group, and those quick reference sheets are far more comprehensive uh, they, they do jam a lot more into them, and I really, I mean, you could have, you could, you could have fitted in more uh, of those tables in here, I think. Uh, it's a minor criticism, but uh, one all the same. Um, another thing I really like in here, uh, in these rules, uh, there is a, there's a, uh, a section on hints and tips on how to, to um, you know, build your armies. Um, which I think we just saw it actually. Um, so there's some really just good advice in these rules as well, just relating on, uh, relating to actually how do you build your armies. Um, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight into the nuts and guts. Um, movement in uh, uh, this rule system is randomised in so far as certain troop types, or better quality troop types will roll uh, uh, average dice. So those are those uh, dice that are numbered two, three, uh, I think it's two, three, three, four, four, five. Uh, and then for the lesser quality troops, they move on D6s, your traditional one to six. Um, so the movement of the less disciplined troops is a little bit more randomized. Um, and in conjunction with that, is um, disruption points. Now, disruption points basically cover all aspects. Disruption um, is, is one of those things that you can uh, uh, pick up during movement, um, and the consequences of having disruption on your units um, feeds into um, it, the unit's morale, the unit's ability to fight a uh, fire uh, using range fire and also to melee. So they really are an important aspect of the rules. So let's talk a little bit about disruption points. Now, what do the actual disruption points 
Um, what are they? What, what, what are we talking about here? Um, well, straight out of the rules, it will st tell you that these are actually critical to the game and they're not found in many other rule sets, including General of the Brigade. So a word of explanation is necessary uh, at this stage. Disruption points represent both the physical disorder and psychological fear or un uncertainty. So that's what they represent. Now, each unit can accumulate disruption points during its movement, uh, morale, uh, tests, firing, or melee phases. Now, once a unit has three disruption points, it's maxed out for disruption, and then any further disruption that's caused, whether it be through fire or melee, um, etc., except for movement, uh, if you pick up a fourth disruption point in movement, it's just discarded. But in every other case, if you pick up a fourth disruption point, that is converted to a casualty. So you can only ever have a maximum of three disruption points and then you start taking casualties. And this is really um, what I think really gives that uh, American Revolutionary War uh, flavor to the game because it's not so much that uh, what makes armies break is uh, the actual number of casualties they're receiving, but just the, the fear and uncertainty, the disorder, um, that is taking place. So that basically, units being reduced to mobs and then fleeing to the rear. Um, so what's critical in the game is keeping your disruption points down so that you can keep your units in the fight. And the better trained, better quality troops, such as the elites and the, the line troops, they're much better at getting that disruption off. Uh, militia, it's difficult for them to get disruption off. And so they're going to be more brittle. Um, Second-rate line troops, they're going to be more brittle, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so it really is a quite a novel way uh, of reflecting that the, the, that friction and loss of cohesion that units uh, can suffer on the battlefield. Now, the way you remove disruption is basically by just standing still or having an officer ride up and take the disruption off. So that that. That standing still is basically when the, the sergeants and junior officers are running around and, and redressing the ranks, getting the men back into line. So I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, this unit here is currently ca carrying three disruption. So that's bad news for them because one more disruption and they're going to start taking casualties. But let's say that these guys are elite. So because they're elite, they can automatically remove two disruption just by standing still. Um, so that will take them, them, them down to one. And if there's an officer attached to them, if he attaches to the unit, his presence can remove that additional disruption. And that gets these guys back into uh, good order again so that they continue the fight. Um, now, obviously, there's more to disruption points than what I've just touched on there. I mean, obviously, you're going to need the rules to find out what all those, dis you know, how that's, that's affected. Um, there's no... Um, the other thing you have to keep track of, of course, is casualties. Now, with the problem with the keeping track of casualties with uh, units where you have multiple figures on bases is obviously if I've got a figure of a base of four figures or three figures and I take a casualty, um, how am I going to keep track of that? Well, you can either use uh, a marker, just as you've used a marker for keeping track of disruption, you can use a marker to keep track of casualties. The other option, of course, is uh, you can do away with these kind of markers completely and you can use a roster sheet because generally speaking, you're not going to have lots and lots of units on the table. Um, so keeping a roster is not, uh, well, I don't think it's uh, too egregious or difficult to do. The other thing, of course, and what I do is I keep, I use a, a little dice tray to keep track of disruption. But when I take casualties, because I have so many of these, you get a box of the perries, you get you get casualty. Uh, you get a casualty uh, or two in the box. Uh, so uh, I've got, and I've just come across a lot of these. So every time I take a casualty on a, on a unit, I just literally place one down next to the the, the figure. Uh, sorry, the base. And once I've, I've accumulated two casualties, because these guys are based three to a base. Once I get the third one, I just take the base away, and I take away the casualties, and I continue from there. And that's basically how I manage it but you know the bottom line is you you can uh, you can use markers a roster sheet uh, dice uh, pebbles little stones whatever and there are suggestions in the rules on how to keep track of disruption um, and casualties in the game 
And like I said, the other one of the other uh, key elements to these rules is um, the use of officers. And you're constantly, as, as the, the, the battle, as the game goes on and the, and the battle's taking place, you, you, one of the conundrums you're faced with constantly is, where do I send my officers to do the most good? Um, and uh, obviously, you know, if you're the kind of guy that doesn't like taking much uh, much risks with your officers, then um, that's fine. But you're going to find that your units are going to start to to come apart at the seams fairly quickly. Um, and officers, the 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 officers did play a significant uh, role in the American Revolutionary War. And now that's not to say they didn't have a significant effect in other wars. Clearly, they did. But these. The, the battles of the American War of Independence were not massive uh, battles that, uh, akin to what you would find in, you know, 1813 Napoleonic uh, Wars of Liberation in Prussia and, and Saxony. The, the, these battles are fairly small. And so the officers uh, have a disproportionate effect on the battle uh, because the battle t- battlefields tend to be somewhat smaller and they would uh, throw themselves into the, uh, the fight more often um, to have an effect. Um, that said, some officers weren't known for actually beating a hasty retreat from the field of battle quite early, and often that would result in their, their troops not being very far behind them. Okay, so let's have a look at um, uh, firing now. Um, firing in British Grenadier is uh, broken into musketry firing and artillery firing. Um, and also there's a chapter specifically relating to skirmish fire. It's pretty straightforward kind of stuff. Um, you're either firing at close or long range, and if you're firing at long range, you simply halve casualties. Um, that's all you really need to do there. The procedure itself is, is pretty straightforward. You simply count up the number of miniatures that you've got firing, and then you um, roll 2d6, you add or subtract, any kind of factors such as, you know, whether or not your the quality of your troops, are your elites firing or are they line or second line? Are they militia firing? Uh, do they have any disruption on them? Then the target, you have to take into consideration whether or not the target is in, you know, things like column march or enfilade. Uh, are they skirmishes? Are they in open order or in, are they in cover? And then simply you cross-reference what you've rolled, uh, plus or minus modifiers, uh, number of figures shooting, and that tells you how much disruption you inflict on your target. Um, and that holds holds true also for artillery, essentially. Skirmishing, a little bit different. Um, you fire by lots of either twos or three miniatures, depending on the quality of your troops. Um, and uh, so that's firing. There's nothing There's nothing terribly unusual there. It's, it's nothing that you, if you've ever played war games, you're going to go, well, this is, looks pretty complicated. It's not. It's pretty straightforward. Now, if we look at the melee system in British Grenadier, again, there's nothing unusual there. The procedure is basically you roll 2d6, you add or subtract the appropriate modifiers. Um, then you compare the, the, the role between the attacker and the defender. And the unit with the highest score is winner. Now, there's obviously there's modifiers like whether or not one unit is outnumbered, um, how much disruption they've got on them. Again, uh, troop quality, you know, are they cavalry? Is it an Indian war band, irregular cavalry, you know, infantry, artillery, all this kind of stuff. The formation and grading and the situation, these all come into into play. And then basically, if you've won by eight or more, the loser routes, their square is broken and routed. Cavalry and infantry must take a pursuit test. If you win by seven to three, the loser retreats and takes two disruptions. And there's a few other things that happen, and so on and so forth. You get a zero, draw, continue to melee in the next round, uh, with the exception that cavalry must retire to their own lines to reform if they have a draw against infantry, because you know they are obviously the horses are probably a little bit blown, and they need to they 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 they, they can simply just trot off, so they do that. Um, so again, melee, the system isn't. Um, terribly er- erroneous. There's nothing too complicated there. So essentially what you get is a rule system that uh, that uses uh, mechanisms that you're pretty much familiar with. Like I said, I harken back to it's the disruption points mechanism 
that seems to be the heart of these rules. They're pretty straightforward, and I, I've played a couple of games now, and the, the game moves along very quickly, and it's all quite intuitive. Uh, there's nothing too complicated. And so now we get to the, the, the part of the rules review where I discuss what I'm not uh, a fan of in British Grenadier. Um, and it's the fact that if you have the deluxe edition uh, of these rules, um, then you've got a bit of a problem because the, they are incomplete. If you have an original copy of British Grenadier, then you've probably been playing it and you're probably not even watching this rules review, but, but if, you, uh, if you had uh, the original copy of the rules, you've, you've essentially got the, the, the complete set of rules. But there's, but the problem with with the deluxe edition and the I think it's called the gentleman's edition, which is even fancier again, is the rules are incomplete. And by that, what I mean is, uh, in relation to picking up disruption, which I remind you is a key component of this rule system. It's the the main mechanism. In regards to picking up disruption for movement. Um, there's a, a big chunk of that that it's missing from the deluxe edition. That is to say, when you conduct normal movement, you're supposed to roll uh, either an average dice or a D6, depending on the troop quality. Whether you roll a two on the average dice or a one or two on the uh, normal D6, if that happens, you pick up a disruption point. Well, for some reason that was left out of the deluxe edition. And from what I've been able to ascertain um, by speaking to um, actual uh, proof readers of this version uh, through the internet is that apparently these rules were rushed into production, into printing, so that they could meet a deadline to be sold at a salute, uh, one of the big wargaming uh, conventions slash shows in the UK. And as a consequence, things were missed. Now I know for a fact that the rules governing the collection of disruption through normal movement, that's not in these rules. Um, but I don't know what else is missed, is, is, is incomplete. So I've been told by people who should know, i.e. the proofreaders, that there was a lot that was left out. <clears throat> Define a lot, I don't know. It could just be a couple of rules, it could be a three or four, I, I don't know. And the problem is, I, I'm not able to confirm what is actually missing from the rules. There's no official errata um, online anywhere. There's no forum that seems to be able to give an answer. It just, all I get is opinions um, because the rule author is essentially just nowhere to be found. Um, I've been told that he does not answer uh, any questions on, on any forums or through any social media. So that's a, that's a massive problem because I'll give you an example. If I have a problem with a rule system, say say there was an issue with, with a rule within O Group, I could go on the uh, Two Fat Lardies Ricewitz Press um, forum, or I could go to uh, Dave Brown's General Brigade forum. I could ask the question there. And generally speaking, within 24 to 48 hours, I get an answer directly from the author of the rules. Because only the author of the rules is an authority on the rules. Everybody else can just offer opinions. Now, to rush out a set of rules just to meet a deadline, knowing that it has not been com comprehensively proofread, I think is, is just uh, kind of kind of average, poor form. Um, I, I, I know for a fact that, uh, and we've all seen it, when rules are produced, they are released and sometimes something's missed, but pretty quickly you get an errata. And so, you know, you can live with it. It happens all the time. It's just one of those things. But for British Grenadier, there are things in this, uh, this version that are missing and I just, I just cannot find out exactly what's missing from it. Now, in... Um, uh, scenario books one and two, and there are four scenario books for British Grenadier. In scenario books one and two, there are 
uh, 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 pages, or well, there's a page in each of those books that um, provide erratas or optional rules, I think they are. Um, and they don't directly address the fact that there's something missing from this book, but it's alluded to. So anyway, the long story short is, unfortunately, the support uh, online and uh, is not there for these rules. And also that if you happen to have British Grenadier Deluxe Edition, you've got an incomplete rule set. So in conclusion, all I would say about British Grenadier is these were a really promising set of rules, but frustratingly, they seem to be incomplete. And there's just not that much online support for them. Um, you could argue that they've been around for a long time. So of course, obviously the, the, the support wanes and it falls away. But that doesn't explain why there was never an official errata produced. And that for me, I think, is uh, reflects poorly on, on the rules. But anyway, I recommend other people to get them. If you're passionate about the period, yes. If it's something that you're not uh, really wrapped up in, no. Because you can always go with Black Powder, second edition, and uh, I, I played, uh, I've played American Revolutionary War games using Black Powder um, and this supplement, and uh, I've had really enjoyable games. And of course, for free, out there somewhere, Loose Files and American Scramble, which is the genesis of British Grenadiers. Um, you can always grab these. And the best, the best part about that is they're free. And another set of rules worth looking at is Live Free or Die, available from Little Wars TV. Uh, you can buy it hard copy, but I just got the PDF download version. Um, really good set of rules and scarily similar, actually, to some of the mechanisms you find in British Grenadier. So it's like, um, yeah, it's like they've taken British Grenadier and they've taken it to another level. So it's worth looking at. Furthermore, plenty of good support. There's Victory of Death, Victory or Death, which is a, 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 a scenarios book, basically. So it's, a again, I've got the, the PDF. You download it. There's lots of scenarios in there. And I'm pretty sure there's even uh, three free scenarios that you can download from Little Wars TV, uh, their website, just go there. I'll put in the link uh, in the description below. Check it out, uh, uh, live free or die. Uh, they look like a good set of rules. Uh, also, if you go onto, you know, whilst you're here at YouTube, check out Little Wars TV, go to their, uh, their channel and look for the live free or die. Um, I think they do a little of a playthrough of one turn and they talk about the rules. So yeah, live free or die. They look pretty interesting, uh, look like a pretty interesting set of rules. Okay, so that concludes my review of um, British Grenadier and an intro to some of the other options you've got for playing uh, the American War of Independence. Uh, just a footnote, um, just as I sign off, I have noticed that uh, Live Free or Die, there's actually uh, a, a part in there in the PDF where it actually pays homage to Andy Callan and uh, Loose Files and American Scramble. That's pretty much it. F feel free to leave comments. Uh, please like, share and subscribe. Um, I'm trying to get to the magical 2000 su subscribers. We're, we're pretty close now. So um, if, uh, if you could share this and uh, encourage people to subscribe I'd appreciate it the next uh, video I'll do I think I'm going to do a 28 uh, mil scale battle American Revolutionary War using uh, live free or die and I might even do one also using British Grenadier and then you can have a comparison uh, a look see to see how how the how the games play so that's all for now um, just remember uh, love your fellow man, uh, and uh, everything's going to be all right. Give it away.